Hey guys, what's up? It's Arc Analyst 420 here, and after so much waiting, Citus 2 version 3.0 is finally here, and as to be expected, it's the worthy finale to the to the Citus series. <clears throat> I was initially hesitant at the $30 DLC pack, which was nothing but an intern from Rayart Games smacking me in the head with a 2x4 while I looked at videos of full male nudity. But you know, if Jeremy from Character Design can get his paycheck to feed his family of two, that being himself and his cat, then, you know, I can sleep soundly tonight. It's just a shame that the Capso system had to happen, where Rayarch literally stained the reputation of this pristine game, came to my house and took a big donkey shit on my PAFF body pillow while screaming racial slurs at me. What? Mom, shut up, I'm trying to rec- Shut up! Joe, cue the transition. Uh, yeah, thank you, Pat. Very enlightening intro. Anyway, ah, oh, shit, boys. Is that the Rayarch problem part two? Probably, because that video is really outdated, was written under the mindset that it wouldn't get much attention, and I have some new detailed counter-arguments that I haven't stopped repeating for the past 16 months. They just yell bad takes at me while I'm sleeping, man. They won't leave me alone. Citus 2 has been out for a little over two years now, and as a result has been given an immense amount of time to simmer, and yet the flames are roaring after the implementation of what might just be the most polarizingly received new feature. The Capso system, or as we like to call it here in the cafe, I TOLD YOU SO! But because I like being accommodating to those not fully in the know, especially as this is a brand new show, welcome to the pilot of Joe's cast by the by, I think it only makes sense that we start from the very, very beginning and cover our bases. Yes, I tricked you, this video is not just about Capso, I think the Capso talk doesn't actually start until about 15,000-ish words in. This TED talk here is actually a full deconstruction on why Citus 2 is an enemy of the state, has committed literal war crimes, and how I'm correct and definitely not mad because a bunch of people on the internet think they owned me and that's not allowed. Especially while they continue to insist my username is based on Citus 2 when it's a voice reference I came up with before C2 even came out, but that's just beating a dead horse at this point. I was initially hesitant to do all this, thinking I'd get a bunch of commenters telling me I'm retreading ground or that I'm just wasting time and saying nothing, but with 2020 rolling around, I've casted aside the cynical shit-smearing Joe's Cafe you know from the days of old who purposely picked fights with his audience. And to be honest, most of those fights would only happen when the individual was being a condescending dick to me beforehand with zero debating skills, but that's just splitting hairs. And with my much more optimistic outlook, I was able to give myself the confidence to know that people would have a problem with this essay regardless of the tone I use, because of course they'd have an issue with a gay Gen Z having an opinion. That was a joke! So let's start on history, for those who aren't caught up. <clears throat> Citus 2 was summoned from the depths of hell via blood sacrifice back in Taipei City, Taiwan, with the intent of brainwashing as many denizens as possible into thinking corporations are their friends. No, 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 this isn't right. I promised myself I'd be much nicer to you guys, you know, new year, new me, that kind of stuff. So let's do this properly, after a few sessions of therapy, and without raising any blood pressure. I'm just here to inform right now, not to blame, inform. Give me a chance here. Citus 2 is the iOS and Android sequel by Rayout Games, which released in January 2018. The game involves the traditional Citus gameplay of tapping circles that appear in time with music to follow a cast of characters in their lives in a city inhabited by SoundCloud rappers and basically everyone who's ever set foot in my comments section, with complex themes and events like hacking, the idol industry, human trafficking, and even robot murder lesbians. I don't know, I dipped out the story back in version 1.4 and I just gleamed the plot from Reddit memes. And as such, the game has earned years worth of support and a cult following for its story, characters, and gameplay, but uh... <laughs> AAA and mobile gaming can never get its dick out of anything, can it? And yes, Rayarch are basically AAA at this point. The moment a company you like starts doing the stuff they can do with their budget and marketing is the moment you can't really act like their poor little indie developers. They have their own convention, run a small business on the side, and publish other developers' games for fuck's sake. Citus 2 is a contentious game, probably more so than any of Rayarch's other titles, because back in the demo days, Rayarch discourse would just be something mildly irritating, like, grr, there's so many songs you have to spend money on. And in an ideal world, that would be our biggest worry. It was a simpler time. It was a better time. Kind of like how back in 2006, the worst thing we had to deal with was horse armor. But then capitalism decided to advance its mutation into utter shit when I wasn't looking because Rayarch took that mildly irritating issue and basically turned themselves into super EA with less of the fever, but just as much of the psychological trauma. And I ain't even talking about the mobile version of Voice today, though some crimes must never go unpunished, children. Citus 2's gameplay involves songs for the rhythm gameplay being bundled together into individual characters that by playing the songs from, you can level up each character and earn story events and so social media posts specific to them, and back in 2017, C2's trailer was shown to feature five of these characters. 
Warpath, Neko, Robohead, Xenon, and Connor. And it was from there that we were immediately getting ourselves sunk into this new experience with raised eyebrows when we were left to discover on the Apple and Google Play stores that the upfront 199 GBP, or Great British Pound, asking price was just to access the first three characters, Path, Neko, and Robohead, with the other two, Xenon and Connor, being launch day expansion packs that cost 999 GBP each. Indeed, the pen that set off the laundry list of issues surrounding C2's business model and what it means for its players, the first brick of Stonewall, if you will, but for sleazy corporate entities. But before we go into detail, let's start with an anecdote of the Citus 2 launch day experience. So if you're like me, succumbed to the launch day hype of Citus 2 and bought the entire package, you got a little weirded out upon realising that despite being optional DLC, Xenon and Connor's chapters actually contain story and information that adds more to the world of C2 outside of IM, the fictional social network that's progressed through the other three characters, so the two aren't exactly extra song packs, nor are they self-contained stories. This leads you to assume that Xenon and Connor's chapters are the other half of the game, with the initial upfront price acting as a trial version of sorts to hook players in before bumping up to the premium, which makes sense considering the flak full price mobile games like Super Mario Run get in this market, so it's something you're initially willing to roll with under this theory. So you continue playing through the presumably full game during its launch period, and the game just ends. Like it just closes out with credits after a cliffhanger where nothing gets resolved. And for some reason you're okay with that. I mean, it's not the greatest thing to ever be implemented, but considering you're an existing fan of Rayok's other title, Demo, you assume the other half of the game is going to be added through a 2.0 update. But oh you sweet summer child, because just a handful of months later a new paid DLC character gets added called Cherry, who you foolishly purchase thinking she was a late addition they needed additional time on, and that her chapter contained the ending of the game. We like to have fun here in the Rayok Games fandom, basically every single time a game gets updated we just go, is this the ending of the game? Probably not. Because you find out Cherry's chapter is structured exactly the same as Xenon and Connor's, where it's mostly additional story events but nothing's actually getting concluded or resolved, and it's the moment Citus 2 1.4 happens where new character Joe gets added, who's also paid DLC, and you immediately dip out the game after realising what the fuck it's doing. It was cute when C2 originally got announced and all the comments were of people begging Rayok not to make the game like Voice, because don't get me wrong, Voice's business model was shit, but in honouring those requests, Rayok basically made a business model that's just as bad as Voice, if not worse. <sighs> For those who are out of the loop, or generally new to Rayark discourse, are you ready for the extended lecture on how Citus 2's progression and business model works? Because while I'm explaining all this, I want to emphasise as much as humanly possible that this is something Rayark Games never explained or alluded to in any of their marketing, store pages, or even the game's own tooltips and UI. We initially went into Citus 2 thinking it was a full game we purchased up front, and this is all stuff that I and the rest of the game's player base had to figure out on our own as the game went on. And even if this information was available on external resources like social social media, that doesn't change the fact that none of this is communicated to people who just pick up the game in of itself. See, you can't just purchase Citus 2, play it, finish it, and then move on with your life like video games have functioned for years, and it's more of a live service game, and brushing aside the fact that a single player story focused game with a live service model is a pretty concerningly out there concept in of itself that doesn't provide any advantages to the end user, it also doesn't function exactly alike to that of an MMO or shared environment game like Final Fantasy XIV or Destiny, where you can theoretically finish it, or at least a main campaign with additional side stuff later to keep you playing. Instead, the upfront version of Citus 2 without additional paid content is a vessel for an ongoing story that changes and evolves as the game gets older through patches, with the end credits of the 1.0 build simply being the opening prologue of the story, and the additional events of the game's version 2.0 update a full year later just being the ending to a season 1 of the narrative. May I remind you once again, this was something we did not know. We found out C2's story had multiple seasons the moment we read 2.0's patch notes a full year later where they said, unveil the mysterious truth of season 1's storyline. Yeah, yeah, thank you you guys, you're very good at disclosing information about your games at the most appropriate and critical moments so we can make informed purchasing decisions as consumers. While all this is going on, you not only have the black market, where you can spend 4 99 GBP a pop for packs of additional songs for the characters in the base game, which since launch have increased from 3 to 5 with the addition of Ivy and Crystal Punk, but there are also the paid expansion pack characters that cost 9 99 GBP each and not only have their own songs and story events, but have since increased from 2 to 10 with the addition of Cherry, Joe, Aroma, 
Roma, Nora, Neko as in actually Neko and not her streamer persona, I think? Hatsuna, Goddamn Miku, Cigar, and Rin. Are you confused yet? Good, because I've been stuck in a constant state of confusion for the past two years now. When you have friends and mutuals who download the game and you have to send them two paragraph long essays explaining how the game's release system and DLC works, that's how you know a game stepped into the rarely reached boundary of triple fucky. Also, for the rest of this podcast, if I have to mention Neko's two chapters again because the only name difference between them is one has emoticons, I'm just gonna call the bundled one Neko Prime and the paid DLC one Precore Neko. Sound good? Okay. There are dozens of problems with this approach to game directing, storytelling, monetization, basic human decency and respect, making good art, and all sorts, with the elephant in the room I want to get out of the way immediately because there's not much to say about it being the price. Getting the entirety of C2 costs way too much compared to larger scale games in the industry, to the point of where Citus 2 effectively has a privilege barrier. In the past, DLC in video games was the additional vignette to enjoy after the game's life cycle, but here it's one of the imperative attractions that sticks its dick in the main course with no mention of dessert, meaning if you have money, you're enjoying a much more fleshed out and complete version of the game compared to someone else. This experience overall totals to £91.90 GBP, and in case you're wondering, that's just from adding up the cost of the base game and the nine expansion pack characters who are actually involved in the story. This being the exclusion of the Black Market packs, which are just additional songs and nothing else, and Miku, a promotional character who has a self-contained, detached story. Which, of course you'd only know is detached and not required to play if you were eagle-eyed enough to read the description of the character's announcement trailer on YouTube. Yeah, yeah thanks again guys. Yeah, informed purchasing decisions, I love them. This information alone results in a 50-50 split when brought up, either being condemned for being overly excessive in terms of monetization, or being excused and, dare I say it, outright praised. After all, it is just optional content that happens to expand your already enjoyable experience and you could just get the packs you want during a sale. It means we get free updates with more story events and songs and we're funding development to make sure they can make the game they want to make. Come on Joe, Rayok were even- <coughs> Nice enough! To update the storefront description of the game with a disclaimer saying you should only purchase based on personal interest, ensure that you don't overspend, and that you avoid addiction. At the very bottom of the description. The description of the game that they designed to be addictive and sold the way they did. And see, if you have a problem with something as insulting and dehumanizing as that, that just means you're an entitled communist that's killing artists, because as we all know, consumer and developer rights are mutually exclusive, and one party needs to get shit on in order for the other to be satisfied. It's just how the world works. No, really, stop laughing. This boot just happens to taste nice when I lick it, okay? But rather than sit here and be salty, I feel it only makes sense to deconstruct as many counterpoints I can think of. The first thing to note going in is that, yes, Rayart games are a company and their prime goal is to make money, otherwise they wouldn't be standing today and still making games. But what skews the narrative and paints those critical of Citus 2 as entitled banshees having a tantrum because they want everything for free is not only the painting of making money as some noble charitable act by Citus fans that's justifiable by default regardless of scenario, but also the dogmatic all or nothing debating approach by the game's defenders. Oh, so you don't like this very particular and specific way DLC is sold, judging by your critique which was made on a case by case basis? Man. You must really hate artists and spending money on things. A very weird way to come to a conclusion, but let's just roll with it for a sec. Now firstly, if there's anyone here who loves spending money on random shit they don't need, it's me, so we can kind of sweep that away. But secondly, this stems from the wrong-headed idea that C2's business model was begrudgingly designed as the bare minimum they had to do to make the game profitable and sustainable, and that literally no other business models were available that would reap the same goal of sustainability, like only making the song packs DLC, while making all the story content part of the base game, like in Demon or even providing the entirety of Season 1 in the base game, with Season 2 being a singular expansion pack or a standalone game. It paints the current state of the game as a compromise, something Rayark had to do, otherwise the game wouldn't exist. But that line of thinking shows a clear misunderstanding of not just game development and business in general, but even just the general logic behind how things are made by people. A similar critical barrier game companies like to hide behind that shares a similar outcome to this is solution selling. This being the process wherein a company will intentionally provide issues with a game's model, such as it being excessively grindy or locking out content, and then provide either a justification or an additional paid product or service that alleviates the problem while still pleasing the general audience. Solution selling is surprisingly effective because to the collective consciousness, it paints video games as uncontrollable entities that function independently, and by 
by selling a solution, companies are able to not only make extra cash from existing customers, but will also get good PR as the general public fails to realize that the issue they paid money to overcome was brought on by the company to begin with. Examples of solution selling sparking this unearned brand loyalty include Mike Fahey's Kotaku article on Plants vs. Zombies Garden Warfare, where microtransactions were introduced to counteract the grindy progression system, which Fahey headlined with thank goodness, the late Total Biscuit's defense of Overwatch loot boxes, saying that some people have more money than time and would prefer to get the in-game cosmetics immediately, and a rather entertaining account from a Fallout First subscriber for Fallout 76 who praised the progression benefits of the subscription service under the pretense that he only has two days off work so doesn't have the time to gather in-game currency or farm workshops. All three of these examples show solution selling working as intended, because the individuals mentioned failed to realize that the problems they want to circumvent were intentionally put there by the companies selling them the circumvention tactic, that the company involved purposely made the game less fun and more inconvenient so they could make you snap and pay extra money for something that makes it less tedious and more bearable. It's the gaming equivalent of a man who sets you on fire, you then pay $10 for him to put you out, and then you start thanking him for his heroism, completely forgetting that he set you on fire to begin with. Citus 2 doesn't have any grinding that monetization circumvents, at least not internationally, as characters, be they bundled or paid, are leveled up individually through gameplay and gameplay alone. But when looking at the bigger picture of how the business model is accepted by the broader rhythm game community, Citus 2 still makes use of what is essentially a larger scale mutated strand of solution selling. In this case, the DLC is the solution to Citus 2's manufactured issue of paranoia and guilt fueled risk of not existing in the first place. We as an audience are quick to believe if we lived in some parallel universe where Citus 2 had its own thoughts and feelings, that its structure and scale were set in stone, and that the project couldn't have been literally any video game of any scale and budget in existence. You'd think in a hypothetical situation where Rayart couldn't afford selling Citus 2 normally and in a less segmented fashion and really needed to do some penny pinching, they do something normal, like cut down on production expenses rather than shoulder more cost to the consumer. If they really were an indie studio, you'd think they'd make more indie scale games so they don't implode on themselves. The Rayark need money to sustain themselves argument quite literally implies the idea that Rayark houses some of the most incompetent businessmen in the industry. And as a mutation of solution selling, it feels like the pyromaniac setting himself on fire and then telling you he'll only put himself out if you slip him a 20. Like, yeah, you need that 20 from me, but if you really wanted it, you could have just asked instead of setting yourself on fire, dude. Like, fucking perish. That's a rod for your own back if you were the one holding the lighter. And unfortunately, the scale of Citus 2 itself starts to become immensely hyperbolic when you break down the game structurally. A lot of defenders are quick to justify the monetization under the pretense that because the game looks pretty and has a story mode in it, that therefore means it's expensive and requires as much money from us as possible. Value really is in the eye of the beholder, huh? Because in actuality, while a considerable budget is needed for sections of the game like new visuals and original music, there are very clear signs of cut corners for the sake of optimization. And when I say optimization, I don't mean on a technical level for the hardware, but on a production value level to allocate those funds to more critical parts of the game. Save for the occasional animated cutscene or illustration, Citus 2's story is primarily told through text, using the same visual and mechanical interface the game has been using for the past two years. And save for the unique artwork each individual song in the game has, some of which can be outsourced to contract artists without formal employment or promise of a salary or royalties, there's nothing about the game's charts or text events in particular that require additional asset production. By now, for accessibility and efficiency, the charts are most likely produced using a proprietary editor that's been built into the game engine to allow flexibility while also saving on precious development time. Meaning the free content patched into the game outside of major story events has an extremely high chance of just being, well, development table scraps that they can afford to hand out, like a lesser known song by Rayox in-house artists who are likely on a fixed salary anyway, or a random IM post a developer jotted down in their spare time on a post-it for fun. Citus 2, in actual fact, has a very simplistic, cost-cutting, easily replicable, and easily amendable structure in terms of asset usage and adding new content into the game. So while there is likely to be a steep hike initially whenever something larger needs to be made, like an animated song selector for a new character, that's just how controlled initial investments work, and the bulk of the game is mostly just assets and code being reused for different contexts and purposes. Ultimately, sustaining Citus 2 long-term in areas like adding new songs, charts, and dialogue is something that Rayark only need to pay their already projected and already accounted for operation costs on, and I significantly doubt that their bare minimum operation costs are so dangerously high. Because while there is the investment of manpower, staff salaries, and licensing, most of the raw high investment new production work has already been made and accounted for in advance thanks to the sales figures from the game's launch period. And over time, less 
lessening the blow from those larger investments that involve raw production. Less and less of Citus 2 is required to be sustained by its own sales, especially as the game just existing over time doesn't necessarily have any consistent outgoings, as it's a digital exclusive title that runs locally on the device without operating any online servers, and theoretically can mass produce thousands upon thousands of copies of itself at no additional cost. So if Citus 2 lasts a little bit longer, it basically becomes a source of free money at this point. Citus 2 is a game that a customer can, as of writing, spend a maximum of £171.76 GBP if they so wish to, this being a total price of buying the game, every single expansion pack, black market song pack, and the new Capso system. And while one can argue that you need only buy the parts of the game you actually want, that's not the point. The point is that some people still want all that content, even the weaker parts, for a full experience. On top of this, value packages like the console versions of Rayok's other three rhythms games, Citus 1, Demo, and Voice, have proven that a game is significantly more enjoyable to the end user when you're not stuck seeing each individual facet of the game as a monetary investment that you need to be extra sure about to get your money's worth. Because when sold in a segmented manner like Citus 2, it can initially look like player freedom and choice, but in reality it just turns the game you're playing into an exhausting gamble of trying to avoid buyer's remorse for as long as possible, which can shatter the fun and immersion into thousands of pieces when we're constantly thinking about all these parts of the game that have zero to do with the actual game itself as an art form. And regardless of how much C2 has in terms of song count, it still pales in comparison value-wise to other rhythm games. Hatsune Miku Project Diva Future Tone, for example, provides a roughly 220 song set list for 32.99 GBP without buying any DLC. Citus 2's base game at 199 GBP right now provides 139 roughly, and to make up for that 81 song difference in equate to Future Tone's 220 song package, you'd have to then spend either an additional 79 86 by buying every single black market song pack, followed by at least two character expansions, or at minimum an extra 69.93 by buying seven different character expansions. Things then get even more messy when you consider not just that character expansions technically get you more content for less than the black market packs when you refer to those sums from earlier, which poke a hole in the idea that C2 is sold in proportion to how much it gives you, but the fact of the matter is this mindset of justifying pricing based on content quantity is completely moot because Future Tone not only provides more songs at a lower cost, but there's a significantly higher budget to each individual song. Songs in Future Tone not only have unique artwork and charts like Citus 2 does, accounting for those manpower and licensing costs, but on top of those, every song in the game has a music video, almost all of them being 3D animated, rendered in real time, and come with a unique 3D model cosmetic for a character in the game. And one could argue this is a bad comparison, because Citus 2 is made by a single company in Taiwan, while Future Tone is made by a larger gaming company with backing from another music and software company. Company, but the observations made of the production value still stand as the amount of money you have doesn't necessarily change how much things cost. If we took Future Tone exactly how it is, but we just changed around which company created it, its development costs would still effectively stay the same on account of what went into its production no matter who makes it, so the price is still justified. So not only is the hypothetical distribution of value to content amount less in Future Tone, but the individual content chunks are providing way more to the player at the same time which causes the entire argument to fall through. This argument I'm referring to being, a song costs a dollar on iTunes, so a song can cost a dollar in a game, right? Which is sound in theory if it weren't for the fact that a song in a rhythm game exists for a completely different purpose than a song on its own. Buying a standalone song from a storefront is the act of buying the product you purchased with the full intent to listen to that song, and your experience is relied fully on what you take away from listening to that song. Citus 2, on the other hand, is a rhythm game, meaning there's not only songs, but visuals, gameplay, story, and so on, and an individual track is but a microcosm of the core Citus 2 experience, which makes the price less justifiable. In a bubble, a song costs a dollar on iTunes, but a song in a rhythm game, while it technically provides more than listening to a song on its own because of the interactive chart, does not cost a dollar for the same reason we don't apply this thinking to content in other genres, like maps, playable characters, or weapons. Not only because other companies know it's not wise to shift all these expenses onto the individual customer, and no costs will be accounted through multiple sales, but because the perceived value of an asset is less when applied to the bigger picture it's part of. A 3D model of a gun could take 8 hours by a designer being paid UK minimum wage, but that doesn't mean it should be sold as DLC for 65-68 GBP, unless you want to suggest that because Super Mario Odyssey has 999 moons that it should cost $999, or that because Super Smash Bros soundtrack has over 850 songs that it should cost as much. So yeah, a song costs a dollar on iTunes, and a rhythm game DLC track can cost that too if it wants, but it means that the game starts totaling up to costing more than 
double the average high budget AAA game, especially in such a short frame of time and before the game's actually finished. Then with that additional context, the rule kind of starts to shatter into pieces and you start missing the forest for the trees. There's more aspects than just that to keep in mind with regards to how a company functions though, which lessens the idea that Citus 2 is a game that relies on its consumer base to keep Rayark afloat. Firstly, there's investors. Simply put, Rayark, like to other companies, would most likely make use of investors who pay the company a large lump sum in exchange for getting a return at a later date. So while there are outgoings Rayark need to stick to, the initial investment on developing a new game doesn't 100% come from the team's own pockets, lessening the risk of disastrous events like bankruptcy. And say we found out later Rayark was a private company that used its own funds 100% all of the time, and honestly that sounds like economical suicide, but that's just me, they wouldn't be stupid enough to work so far out of their budget if so much was on the line. If you're a fan of Citus 2 who purchases content under the pretense that you want to support further development and wish to support character designers and artists, not only are you partially lying, which I'll get to at the end of this video, but you've opted for a losing battle under the fact that staff at game companies like Rayark work either under salaries or third-party contract work. Xenon and Connor could have absolutely tanked under a much harsher market, and there would be a lower profit margin, but David in character design and Sarah from sound engineering would still be quids in as they were contractually agreed payment that the game's own success is detached from. Following that, where those salaries come from could be anything that's funding Rayark, from the character pack you just purchased to those investors we mentioned earlier, to someone in another continent buying a Sudorica summon. In game development, payment mostly goes straight into a pot of Rayark's general funds which can be put forward to anything, meaning that $4.99 you spent in the C2 black market could either go to contracting an animator for the new Sudorica trailer, paying back an investor who has zero involvement in the production, or it could go to resupplying the toilet paper in the implosion team's restroom. I mean, it's the same place they plan their writing and design their combat mechanics, so you gotta keep it stocked up. The game industry is a much more complicated machine than just developer makes product which costs money, followed by customer gives money in exchange for product with a loop from there. Instead, when you think about it some more, who's to say the money earned from C2 even goes straight towards the developers? As salaries are contractually fixed, for all we know, all that money could be collecting dust in the mainframe while the developers are being paid well below what their bosses could be paying them based on how much capital they own. The framework that makes a game company, how game development can cost an entity, and the measures a company would take to reduce the risk of bankruptcy sets up this situation where Citus 2's monetization is nothing more than excessive, as it conditions a more easily swayed customer to ignore the fact that so many more parties have the ability to cover development costs than just themselves, and it's not just the customer's job to shoulder all of those expenses. But let's say either you're perfectly okay with that or you're not convinced. This section of the essay is more conjecture I wanted to just throw out there before we get to the actual juicy bits, and you could easily turn to me and say, oh, you're just making things up to make your argument sound better. You're not showing anything concrete, and for all we know, they really do need all this funding from us to supply the content we have now. But not only does that once again fall back into an argument ages ago in this essay that literally any other less anti-consumer business model could have been used in Citus 2, but you can easily slip yourself into Rayark's shoes through some common sense and resourceful thinking. This entire debacle is an extension of the games are too expensive to make argument you commonly hear in monetization discourse in the game industry. But just like solution selling, not only is it a bunch of smoke and mirrors bullshit, but it's an argument that only holds water under the mindset that the scale of a game is somehow out of a company's control, and that this is the only business model that's sustainable for that budget. I want to cast your minds back to the loot box discourse in Overwatch, and how it was a paid game that sold cosmetics through a randomized system optionally influenced by payment. A common defense by fans was that the additional funding of purchasing loot boxes provided the budget for additional content and ensuring artists and developers got paid, and as such it was morally okay. This was built on the belief that the upfront cost of Overwatch wasn't enough to sustain the development. But even if you agree with and roll with that point presented, it just raises the question of why Overwatch charges upfront in the first place if the revenue from that is supposedly worthless and not enough, as well as asking the question of why they had to use a loot box system in particular and not anything else like selling the cosmetics separately or in one-time purchase bundles. Now, I'm not saying that everyone on the Citus team is in on it. Just because someone did a song for C2 one time doesn't mean they advocate predatory monetization. But fact of the matter is that Citus 2, as well as Rayark's other titles, are developed with a fixed budget. And that fixed budget is determined from how much investment they can earn, as well as how much the developer has currently available to them. When a defender of Citus 2 argues the paid content is fine because of what it provides alongside the free updates and that it puts food on developers' tables, I need only ask the following. If Rayark are hanging by a thread, like you say, and require our support and funding to keep making games, why don't they just make smaller games with a more reasonable budget. Seriously, what would stop Rayark from just selling the complete game on its own, with no additional expansion packs or DLC, and then they just add content once it's plausible within their
their budget? And the answer to that is because that's what they're already doing. So I just use business model was an optional implementation that exists because they just chose not to use a different model. If Citus 2 was as reliant of its current monetization model as people say it is, no company, not even Rayark themselves, would go through with it because it's just far too much of a risk. But would also be immensely impractical as it would end up making them less money compared to a game that's more reasonably costed. Citus 2, in actual fact, has one of the riskiest business models in the game industry right now because it relies so heavily on customer trust, goodwill and emotional investment to tolerate monetization excess. That is something much more fragile and less tangible than something simple like customer value or audience appeal, marketing tactics that reel in newcomers and industry skeptics that don't have any prior devotion or investment. And that's because of a certainty and perception of safety by Rayart Games that the current model will allow them to reap a much larger revenue stream off their current fan base. If Citus 2 was as big of an economic chunk as we like to say it is, that it is an expensive game, Rayark would go for a much safer business model to make sure the survivability of their company was guaranteed, which is something Rayark themselves did back in the Citus 1 days with the million downloads plan in Citus 1 2.0. C1 2.0 introduced a chapter-based story mode, where every 100,000 sales of the game added a new chapter as DLC and unlocked the previously locked DLC chapter as free unbundled with the base game. It was an equally iffy process as the new chapters released as paid for a period of time before being unlocked to capitalize on early adopters but despite that, Rayark transparently showed that the game was being developed within the range of their ability, without select customers needing to stump up the cash to excessive levels just to experience everything the game had to offer. And it means they earn additional revenue from late adopters purchasing the game, who can experience Citus 2 in almost its entirety, because the budget that went into developing those once-locked chapters has been accounted for already, so doesn't require charging customers anymore. Citus 1 had a much safer business model than Citus 2, because as it was Rayark's very first game, it had a much more fragile presence in the market, and so Rayok needed to stay within their boundaries and tiptoe around audience needs to sell it the way they did. Citus 2, on the other hand, is developed by a completely different Rayok that is expansive, prosperous, and has hit this rock-hard barrier of a rabid fanbase that something a bit more sketchy that leads to a higher profit margin seems so much more plausible, and so they went with it. As you think further and further about how the game industry works, the safety of business moves under different contexts, and how Citus 2 stacks up in terms of production value to other similar games, the intent is very clear. Citus 2's additional monetization is not there because Rayark needed to put it there, but because they want to put it there and know they can capitalize on the Citus brand for excess revenue and achieve corporate growth as quickly as possible from the coattails of our emotional investment. It's not something that can be definitively proven, I don't have the receipts, but the implications are right in front of us, and the stance that this is all charity and that customer morale is in their best interest can't be definitively proven either. It's just that my stance not only has a much safer and logical approach to it from Rayark's perspective, but acknowledges the bigger picture of the industry instead of boiling it down to, things cost money so customers give us money to make the thing otherwise we die instantly game over. It's kinda like that time people thought that because Telltale Games had gone bankrupt that meant they couldn't give their former workers severance pay. As a community mass, we like to oversimplify concepts with our own rules to make them more understandable to the less business savvy, and unfortunately this repeated process of how we dumb down the discussion of games has over time gone down the the route where companies can exploit us because we're so good at silencing each other with random pro-corporate truisms that lack any logical ground. But with the common counter-arguments dispelled, we now come to the tirade of why Rayok chose this particular business model, what it is under the hood functionally, and how Rayok benefit from it. The Citus 2 fan that exists in my head for hypothetical counter-arguments could, in theory, acknowledge everything I've said in this talk, but still be willing to defend Citus 2's model due to a perceived moral high ground Rayok possesses in the cult following eye. After all, regardless Regardless of how excessive the monetization is, and regardless of whether or not Rayark actually need the funds from the current business model, it's still just straightforward business with buying and selling, right? That was actually a point I used to hide behind back when I was really into Demo. The original mobile version of Demo may have had an immense amount of song packs that would lead to a heavily rung up bill if all were purchased, but it's just content that's produced and bought at a price with minimal fuss and that's it, right? I mean, it's better than what's going on in the AAA game industry, what with loot boxes, other gambling-esque randomization mechanics, currencies that can be purchased with 
with real money, subscription fees, not to mention what's going on in other mobile games with ads, energy meters, and so on. Rayot games are as honest as monetization can be, as it's just ordinary DLC. They're nothing alike to the EAs and Ubisofts of the world, and the only way anyone can have an issue with them is if they hate the very idea of DLC itself. Or at least that's what we tell ourselves in a world without nuance. But in actuality, Rayok's own brand of DLC is not only a far cry from how it's handled on other games and services, but okay, hear me out on this one, I'm really proud of myself if you can't tell. Rayok's brand in particular makes use of insidious business tactics involving psychological manipulation that present Rayok as just as bad, if not worse, than the moustache twirling corporation owners we in the bread tube gaming pundit sphere like to complain about. So, let's get to the fun part. First tactic we have being used in Citus 2 is customer confusion. The state of mind in which a customer is more likely to make impulsive purchases due to a lack of information, or working from their own personally established interpretations. Now, what if I told you Citus 2 was vague on purpose? I'm being serious. I mentioned numerous times when summarizing Citus 2's launch period that Rayok were horrendous at communicating to customers how Citus 2 worked and was sold. Even if that information was available in something like a Facebook post only available in Japanese or whatever, or that we could have known if we just reached out to customer support, the fact of the matter is there's nothing along the lines of tutorials, tooltips, or even a future content roadmap in the game's software itself, and in all available localized languages that conveys the business practices carried out by Rayok Games. A lot of critics of more AAA titles like to criticize the increasing presence of roadmaps in games like Anthem, Smash Ultimate, and Fallout 76. Diagrams of planned content that isn't in the game yet, but if it's any consolation guys, at least you actually get a tangible visual roadmap of what's coming unlike the Citus fans. There's nothing like the million downloads plan where you could open a web page from within the game and be told directly, hey dipshit, if we reach another 100,000 sales we'll add a new chapter. And I don't think Citus 2's website has been updated since the game came out. Upon further reflection, this lack of conveyance can be read Partially as poor planning on account of stuff like the website and dodgy localization, but primarily as a business move with the full intent of coercing ill-informed purchases within Citus 2. One can provide the argument that complaints about the character expansions are moot because, quote, the expansion packs aren't needed, they're just for additional lore and character development. But nowhere in the game is this stated, not even in a fluffy, promotional sort of way that makes it sound good, like a text box saying, enrich your Citus 2 experience with additional story events, that hints of some semi semblance of optionality or supplemental enjoyment. And it's not like the game's structure is a given, it's hardly something you can just glean without being told by outside sources due to the game's direction and visual conveyance. Xenon and Connor, the first two character expansions of Citus 2, were given an equal marketing spotlight in the game's announcement trailer and other promotional material alongside Path, Neko, and Robohead, implying to customers an equal level of importance, that they're the main characters and a part of the core experience, with no clear mention of them being DLC or or in separate chapters until the game's store page was up. And in the game itself, the moment you tap past the title screen, they as well as every other paid character expansion from then on are shown on the character selection screen of the main menu clear as day, again with an equal spotlight and equal amount of visually implied importance to the bundled characters rather than being where they should be, tucked away in a separate store page like the black market packs and the capso system to imply that they're additional and not just parts of the core game sliced up to sell for more money. On top of this, the IM page where the base game story is told introduces Xenon and Connor into the plot basically immediately, and as players progress through Path, Neko Prime, and Robohead's chapters on the launch builds, they're met with the story closing out on a cliffhanger with end credits, with no tooltip, notification, or even fanfiction-esque footnotes saying author's note ran out of ideas, come back later when we patch more plot in. Especially as the first major update to the game, Citus 2 1.1, had its announcement trailer focus not on the new free story content, but on Cherry. The new character whose chapter costs real money to unlock, implying that purchasing the expansions was the main way to progress the game, and the free story elements only exist as a little teaser that adds context to the paid editions. By constructing Citus 2 Season 1 this way, Rayark were able to secure launch period sales of Xenon and Connor, not through promoting genuine personal interest like that insulting condescending description edit wants you to think, but through people dropping 1998 GBP under an assumption that Xenon and Connor's chapters are not supplemental content but the other half of the game, and depending on the time it takes a customer to personally figure out how the game's progression works, could continue buying post-launch character packs like Cherry and Joe, once again, not out of a quote-unquote personal interest, but because they were tricked into thinking it was needed to finish the game and not miss anything important. This is the thing to keep in mind when it comes to discussion about Citus 2. Almost all of the information was learnt through trial and error by the player base. Forum threads asking other players whether or not DLC is important to play is not something a game 
game should have because that's something the game is supposed to inform you. It's kind of like if The Last of Us, instead of being a full game, was four seasons divided into four different patches, and halfway through the drip feed they decided to release Left Behind and everyone started wondering if it would be required to understand the story of winter and spring. And in Citus 2, none of the character expansions come with as much as a bio or a synopsis to give you an idea of what the packs contain story-wise. It's just a greyed out character icon that says Unlock 999, which once again is a very big dick energy business move Rayark would only pull off if they knew they'd be safe doing it. Because they're greedy little fucks, but they're clever greedy little fucks, you gotta at least give them that. As an additional consequence, Aroma, Nora, and prequel Neko's chapters have no way of telling their prequel expansions that are there to provide backstories to Path, Neko Prime, and Robohead, and nothing else, without purchasing them first. And I feel it's just telling of Rayok's lack of confidence in their art itself if they require dishonesty and confusion to ensure investment. So, Rayok Games most likely gathered a chunk of Citus 2's revenue from customer confusion, but that's more of a short-term strategy as forums and social media long after the game has already come out can get you that information. Which is fucking annoying, impractical, and proves my point anyway, but go off I guess. Citus 2 still isn't out of the woods though, because we need something more long-term to keep the money rolling. Even if the fanbase wises up to the trickery of customer confusion, we still have everyone's favourite existential dreads to worry about. Hype culture and FOMO, aka the fear of missing out. Because why advertise and sell a good product when you could just play with people's anxiety? As said before, Citus 2 tells a continuous story over time with its launch build acting as the prologue, version 2 acting as the ending of season 1, and so on and so forth. C2 set out to tell a complex story with detailed characters and numerous twists and turns, so obviously, the game's gonna build a cult following of people who are invested in the events, wanna know what happens, and whether or not their favourite characters succeed. And Rayok knew this would happen because of how they released the game. I'm gonna take a moment to just ask you all, what is it about this method of storytelling, this explicitly applying to the drip feed method, that makes Citus 2 more engaging than just releasing the story all at once? Well, there are things we can check off. Suspense is an easy one, anticipating what's coming next and all that. You can be up all night theorising with other fans, with one in question describing the game to me as Rayark's first arc. Even though that's by definition not what an arg is, because all of the storytelling is confined to one narrative medium in a fictional universe and the game's community doesn't have an impact on how the story plays out, and even if it was an arg, this wouldn't be Rayark's first because this is exactly what they did with Demo 2.0, but instead of doing it once, they just repeat it over and over again and act like it's not tedious as shit. But here's the sad truth. Most of this attachment was planned, artificial, and manufactured, because Rayark knew it would be the easiest way for you to cough up the dough. There is of course the exploitation of hype culture going on here, as each new update has given a fanfare on Rayark's YouTube channel with climactic music, a description telling you that this is the update that will give you all of the answers, or something similar, while setting up new micro-mysteries along the way, like those post-end card slides that hint at what the following update's gonna have. On reflection, the excitement wasn't necessarily the content itself, but just that something was being hidden from you, and you're being told you'll access it soon, and in theory, they could generate the same amount of hype from basically any point in the story using this method. Like, imagine if you had to wait for an update right after events partway through the 1.0 prologue, like the Asia hack on Neko's stream or after Path collapsed on stage. It starts to sound a little bit less impressive, more forced and artificial, and less reliant on the writing, doesn't it? Like, you know suspense has been a narrative device for years, even in completed works, right guys? I don't know about you, but I prefer stories giving me a reason to care rather than the promise of a reason to care. But that's pretty cut and dry stuff. I'm honestly in no position to fairly evaluate Citus 2's story at this point because I dipped out at 1.4 and there are so many developments that have been made since then which in of itself is a pretty scummy thing as it means the game has gone over two years without reaching a resting point where it's fair to fully critique it. I will say though, as someone who gathers bits and pieces from Reddit, Citus 2 is starting to sound really alienating to and reliant on shock value which makes it really forced and gross. <laughs> Guess who found out about Noah the other day? But the way the game's constructed means that this hype is completely divorced from the actual quality of the writing and directing, and the hype is only there because Rayark artificially stretch out the progression to give you more time to work the game into your routine and grow more emotionally attached, as well as being able to make the game financially relevant over an extended period of time by selling you more stuff on the side. This is different to, say, a TV show or a game that's told in a fixed amount of episodes because at least episodes are written as individual stories, well in good shows anyway, and there is a clear clear structure visible to the viewer so it doesn't look like the cliffhangers are contrived or at random or part of a business model. This was, in fact, the reason I was initially hesitant about saying Demo had one of the best endings I ever played in my Demo video, because as someone who had been playing the game since before the ending was patched in, I was worried that the only reason I resonated so much with the story was because the game had given me about two years to make itself a part of my identity, and I wasn't confident in making such a high critical point unless I had some concrete reasons, and even there I wasn't sure my points were valid 
solid and allowed a friend play through the Switch version blind in a couple of hours to tell me my analysis was sound. But I'm getting sidetracked. Basically all of us know about hype culture in of itself, but things start to get really fun, and I say fun in a fuck you kind of way, when we talk about hype culture's feisty little brother, FOMO. If you play Citus 2, stop me if this sounds familiar. One day when a new update is released, you decide to grind for some XP because some of the level caps were raised. You could do this at your own leisure, you know, when you actually feel like playing the game for fun, but you're working away at it as quickly as possible, even when you're starting to burn out on the gameplay, because you're part of the Citus 2 subreddit and Discord server, and you want to talk about the scene where Simon and Connor had violent sex on the head director of ARC's desk while everyone else is still talking about it, and before the new update comes out and it's old news. On top of this, you decide to buy the new character expansion where you assume the role of the director himself and all of his songs are just Romanian music from the late 2000s, because you need to know what type of coffee he made before he walked in on Simon and Connor fucking. You're a little bit short on funds at the moment, and you were really thinking of saving up for Galgun Double Piece, but goddamn, if you can just find out what coffee the guy had, it'll be the final clue for your extended fan theory on whether or not Neko will get her Twitch suspension lifted for that time she showed her feet on camera, and you can't have anyone else figure that out first. You're doing all this because you can't miss out. This is the basic cycle of FOMO, and how Citus 2 was purposely built as every FOMO capitalist stream. The reason Citus 2 has this ongoing drip feed story full of mysteries to solve is because Rayark know it will keep the social media channels active and get people talking, thus building anxiety for those who are behind on the story and the new content. This was in fact the reason I stopped playing Citus 2 so early. Not only because the business model was blatantly shitty, but the game was just stressful to have in my life, and it felt like I was given the ultimatum of either sticking to the game as closely as possible, or dropping it entirely with no in-between unless I wanted a psychological pummeling. Citus 2 is a game that actively punishes anyone who wishes to play the game at their own pace, and for the past two years I've had this little voice whispering in my ear telling me to get back into the game, because Rayark Rhythm Games are my niche, and being a YouTuber and Twitch streamer who cultivates his own community, of course I'd want to sink my teeth into a big talking point where all the discourse is floating around. This is in fact kinda similar to the Game of Thrones hype train, but if viewership wasn't the showrunner's only concern and they also wanted you to buy a bunch of overpriced hardback novels for each character in the main cast and never told you if they were required, because human beings are social creatures, satiated by knowledge and validation, and when people keep talking, everyone else wants in on that talk and will be willing to invest anything to be part of the discussion. I should know. I'm someone who got into franchises like Pokemon and Kingdom Hearts not out of a personal interest in the franchises themselves, but just because I wanted in on the discourse and I needed to figure out if that Dexit thing was actually worth getting mad about or not. Additionally, Citus 2's scattered content that's expensive to buy over a short period of time also allows for light implementation of the haves and have not psychology seen commonly in games with cosmetic systems. Essentially, as Citus 2 is a game that is both heavily segmented, but also a heated conversation piece, this means that those without DLC will undergo continued exposure to those with it. For example, you could be a player who decides to use their allowance to finally buy Connor because you like his character in the IM post, but then suddenly version 1.8 comes out, and everyone in the community is talking about the backstory of this Nora girl that you now can't afford, let alone inform yourself on if a chapter is worth purchasing to begin with, especially considering the plot isn't done yet so you don't know if progressing further without playing Nora's chapter beforehand will lead to an inferior experience to everyone else. As the character expansions provide more insight into a character's past and motivations, those who paid the most money are much more informed when it comes to discussing those characters in detail, meaning those who haven't bought any additional content just yet will eventually crack the moment they want to stay ahead of the curb and not feel like other people are much more experienced than they are. And an environment where diehard hard owners of a game can't access more of the thing they love if they can't afford it just sounds like the biggest fuck you imaginable, like if Persona social links were DLC or Mass Effect romance options. And someone could say, well, I just look up the cutscenes online, but that's just doing a disservice to games as an art medium, because it incorrectly implies that secondhand knowledge of the lore in any way equates to playing a game's structured experience at your own pace, and evokes the same emotional response. A first-hand experience ensures a player is getting all the details in an effective manner, and how does someone accomplish that? Stump up the cash, of course, which means additional revenue for Rayout Games, all thanks to FOMO. Citus 2 is commonly seen by many as this unique trendsetter that broke boundaries, moved mobile games forward, moved rhythm games forward, but it's actually more of the same old shit we're finding in the AAA game industry today. An overwhelming sludge of live services that didn't need to be live services, but companies went for anyway just because it's the most lucrative, disregarding the limits in resources, energy, and patience of the consumer base, as well as disregarding that some customers just want to finish the games they own so they can move on to other experiences. Yes, 
Yes, Citus 2 is basically the anthem or Fallout 76 of rhythm games, and you can take that quote to my grave. But believe it or not, all this has been pretty standard so far, and from here we get to the more vile and genuinely sadistic parts of Citus 2's structure. If you've hung around the Games as a Business discourse long enough, and by that I mean if you mostly watch Jim Sterling, there is a chance you've heard about Torolf Jernström, CEO of mobile game developer Tribeflame. Jernström got his claim to fame for a video from 2016's PG Connects, a conference for mobile game developers showing the CEO's own panel, Let's Go Whaling, which understandably led to quite the backlash as the CEO had basically zero awareness of if what he was doing was wrong on any moral level. But deep down, I'm feeling very smug and vindicated after realising just how intentional the scummiest parts of mobile gaming are, and how they're not just some happy accident. And I can't help but thank Jernström for giving us this backdoor look, even if he may not have intended for this information shown to be used in this manner. For those who don't know, whale is a term used by game companies to describe players who spend an immense amount of money on singular games, be it cosmetics, gameplay advantages, or whatever else in between. Simply put, if a large amount of money can be spent on a single game by one customer, whales are the customers that will purchase the whole lot. And the reason whales are so valued by companies is because of the revenue you can receive from a small amount of customers, rather than having a lot of people spend a little. In essence, you could have a game with a rather middling player base, but if there's a lot to spend money on with regards to DLC, microtransactions, or similar practices, the whales will be putting in the work to ensure your game's profitable either way. The concept of whales when brought to the public eye was initially scoffed at, because when given a base definition and no further context or information, the average person's idea of a whale is a wealthy consumer who has more money than cents and can afford their chosen method of playing a game. It's the mindset of, eh, it's just rich people, fuck them, nothing to do with me, as if we're not all playing the exact same game. It all falls back to that illusion of customer choice and the incorrect idea that additional monetization is only there for people who can happen to afford it and doesn't ruin the experience of those who can't or don't wish to. Hell, a lot of comments in my Rayout problem essay were telling me to get a job or wait on a sale, but like... I mean, firstly, if you're going down that route, I want to give a genuine fuck you because you're the worst, most privileged, blind kind of person who's only good for compost. But I can afford the entirety of Citus 2. Multiple times over, in fact, if I really wanted to. Hi, I'm Joe's Cafe and I'm probably the most middle class fucker you'll ever meet because daddy's credit card is a wonderful thing. I just still think it's a shitty and manipulative system and acknowledge that this system wasn't just made for me because it also preys on those not as fortunate as myself. As shown by Jernstrom's panel, whale hunting is an immensely reckless, dangerous and dehumanizing way of selling a game that uses non-substance based addiction, emotional investment, psychological abuse, and manipulation to turn anyone vulnerable enough into a whale, even those who don't have the money to spare. To break down into its fundamentals, Jernstrom describes this process as hook, habit, and hobby. Hook is the stage wherein a game is made as accessible and easy to pick up and obtain as possible to the point of where you'd be insane to reject it. This is for the purpose of initiating the process on any customer who owns the gaming platform under the pretense of, eh, I may as well try it. Habit is the stage where you manufacture some form of progression system or gameplay loop to ensure the player is investing a lot of time into the game and is returning to it in some semblance of a routine, and hobby is where, thanks to hook and habit, the player has managed to ingrain the game into being a part of their lifestyle, a part of their identity, and as a result are more willing to invest further time and money into fueling this new facet. And this is where we go back to Citus 2 and all of its in-app purchases. It may look like ordinary, honest DLC that happens to cost a bit too much, but it's way more purposeful and meticulous than that, and part of me wants to to congratulate someone at Rayarch for purposely making such an elaborate Pandora's box of a mobile game that's been so enlightening to pick apart. You know that Always Sunny meme where Charlie just has that big ass board detailing the non-existent identity of Pepe Sylvia? Yeah, we're reaching that point of the essay. Right. You know what the biggest point of irony is in Citus 2? Asia Fest. The event at the very start of the game that kickstarts everything in Citus 2 lore. The easily accessible concert from an artist that gave out free music that drew in millions as part of an elaborate scheme involving fucking with people's minds. <laughs> Citus 2, as a game, is one big downloadable Asia Fest, and we're the unaware crowd being tested. And no, don't give them the round of applause because they're not being clever for this. For what I'm about to say next, imagine I'm saying this in bold because I really want to burn this in. What I posit is that Citus 2 was manufactured under the hook, habit, hobby loop for the purpose of creating whales and generating as much excess revenue as possible from its cult following using psychological manipulation tactics. One or more individuals, most likely marketing specialists or higher-ups at Rayout Games, put forward the idea of making Citus 2 intentionally predatory and fucking with the mentally vulnerable to make their game as profitable as possible. Remember, you're hearing me out. We have this new rule on the channel where you can't write a comment unless you listen to the whole thing, so you're hearing me out on this. So, where do we start on this? 
Well, I guess there's only one place to start, and that's step one, hook. Well, this one's pretty easy. The only real barrier between you and getting your hands on Citus 2 is a smartphone and £1.99 GBP, but that alone doesn't prove anything. Not only because charging that low for a game is a standard practice on mobile, but even that can be a stumbling block. Some people can still be hesitant because it's a cost nonetheless, and some smartphone users just don't like spending money on mobile games, period. Like, I actually know people like that. So it'd be a shame if Rayark were to hold promotional periods where the base game is free to download for a limited time, so even those with a mild passing interest or even people who just see it on the storefront immediately download it, huh? This part is honestly the funniest to me, not only because some fans like to brandish this as a sign of generosity on Rayok's part that somehow makes everything else completely excusable, but because it's concerning how many people don't realise what this promotional period is for. The amount of comments I got on the Rayok problem of people acting like they had beat the system and somehow outsmarted Rayok by getting their hands on the game for free was staggering. I'm very sorry, but you're all wrong. You didn't realise that at the end of the day, Rayark still wins because their marketing scope hasn't even extended to you. People who were vocal about not wanting to financially support the game. Here's what the free promotions teach us. Such as 2's upfront 199 is worthless. The base game is not the actual product Rayark are selling you, but the first step in the lead up to their actual sales pitch. See, in the game industry, as well as media in general, engagement, even engagement where there's no monetary transaction involved, is the most valuable asset in the world. Kinda like how watching a bad show ironically on Netflix will only lead to it getting more seasons down the line because viewing figures all show up in the same collective value regardless of context. So if you have a copy of Citus 2 installed on your device, regardless of whether or not you actually paid for it, and regardless of whether or not you intend to pay for it, you are now part of the game's player base, which means you receive updates to the game. And not only do you get all those new free songs and story events to ensure you're booting it up and never tempted to uninstall, but you also get shown all that new DLC you haven't purchased yet that the game's gonna make extra sure is shown to you at least once to keep it on the mind. Like showing the expansions you don't own on the character select screen, constantly having the black market button light up with a notification you dismiss by opening up the shop. And hey, bonus points if you have push notifications enabled so you can be advertised new content and sale periods even when the game's closed. Citus 2's cheap entry fee along with the ability to download it for free during limited periods of time means that whether you're a long time Rayark fan or someone who is just scrolling the music section on the app store, you all have the game. You've all been given the premise and gameplay, and you've been shown there's more to obtain. People who got the game for free will like to say, well, good thing I'm not easily swayed into buying things. Firstly, you're a sweet summer child if you think you're above corporate psychology. But not only are there people in the world who are that easily swayed, and applying all arguments to just you in particular is intensely close-minded, but even just downloading the game without spending a penny has its own fair share of benefits to Rayark that eventually leads to sales, such as the fact that a shit ton of extra downloads the game can get in its free periods, as well as the increase of positive customer reviews from those free players makes the game more popular statistically, which will make it appear more frequently in search results and recommendation feeds. And Rayark aren't going to operate at a loss with all those free downloads, because even if it means they lost the chance to get $1.99 from a customer, there's still a potential $169.77 worth of additional earnings that they can get from one person, out of a pool of a ton of new players. If you own Citus 2, be it free or paid, Congrats, you were hooked, and you're only one third of the way through the sales process. So step two, habit. This is the part that tends to lose people a bit, because it involves a bit of critical thinking about why a design element in a game exists and who it benefits. And many like to brush off the importance of step two, because to a less attentive critic, these can just be seen as ordinary or harmless game mechanics that either don't affect players, or do affect players but they don't have anything to do with the marketing or in-app purchases at a face value. So for the next two steps, I'm going to be assuming the role of the average C2 player, at least the average C2 player as predicted by Rayark to illustrate this cycle in action. So we've learned Citus 2 has been deliberately sold in a way to get it into as many hands as possible, but whatever. As a new player, I now have access to this in-depth story full of mystery and intrigue with some of the most fun rhythm gameplay I've ever seen. That being said though, I don't have any new songs or new posts at the moment, which sucks because I want to see what happens next and I want to see what other charts I can play. It seems I progress the game through leveling up the characters, but that seems to be taking a really long time and I only get so much out of each new level I reach. The gameplay is really fun though, so nothing's really stopping me from just getting a few charts in every morning so I can get myself caught up in time for that new update next month. And right there, 
That, my regulars, is why Citus 2 uses an XP-based progression system in combination with drip feed storytelling. Over in the console and PC space, Hatsune Miku Project Diva F has you unlock songs by just playing the ones you haven't tried yet. Over in Dance Central VR, you get every single song in the setlist from the get-go, and both games can be finished 100% in just a couple of hours. Because, well, they already got your money, so the progression is only there in a strict gameplay sense of what would the player find more enjoyable and get more mileage out of. Not in Citus 2. Not because there's a shit ton of content that will take ages to get through, in fact, if you had all the songs from the get-go and just unlocked more story every song or so, C2 would be a pretty short game. But as you're expected to grind XP to unlock more content and move on in the story, if you've been successfully hooked back in step 1, it results in you making Citus 2 a part of your daily routine, because your brain is being taught by the game's design that frequent play results in progression which makes the experience more refreshing and satisfying. So, you'll need to return to it routinely. And fun fact, this is why in other games you see those pop-ups that give you rewards if you remember to log in every day, because forming a habit is the second step of Yernstrom's three commandments of being the least fun person on planet Earth. Gameplay design when broken down psychologically is just the player's own journey to get brain chemicals, and Rayok just happened to use the progression system that makes achieving the brain chemicals long-term and habit-forming. Citus 2's progression was structured not for a strict game design purpose, like ensuring the story and content is well-paced for optimal enjoyment, but because it wants you to turn playing the game into a second job that ensures you always have Citus 2 on the mind and puts you in prime condition for more promotion. Even if you're burned out on the gameplay and need a break, well, you can't stop now, not only because your brain's gonna find it unsettling that your new routine has a gap and is gonna say, please play the game, but you also can't stop in case you fall behind the rest of the community and can't engage in the discourse. Because of course the main plot itself has to take the form of post-launch content too if we want you to stick around for an extended period of time. Nobody wanted to buy the song packs we put in Demo 3.6 a few weeks back because we ended the story five years ago. So the only people we're selling to are hardcore fans who are there for the hard charts and that's nowhere near enough of a consumer base for us. Here in Citus 2 two years after it's already released though, not just the highly skilled hardcore players, but even the casual players and lore enthusiasts are here for the post-launch ride, and even the character expansions have story content, so they're even appealing to those who aren't here for the extra songs and charts. So that means even two years down the line, it's like our player base to market paid content to never went on a decline. As a result, if you're a considerable amount of progress into Citus 2 and you're ready and willing for when 3.0 comes out, not only were you hooked, but you successfully made C2 your habit. And we're still not done because we're moving on to step three, hobby. I'm having a lot of fun with these title transitions. Okay, whatever. I just found this game on the app store for free. I've been playing it for the past six months or so, and now I'm really enjoying the story. I even bought a couple of those expansion packs, not only because the wait for the new update was unbearable and I needed more backstory as a tide over, but I even bought some of the black market packs to make it easier and faster to level up the characters I already own, because playing songs you haven't played before gets you extra XP. And might I add, that point I made about buying packs to earn XP faster is technically solution selling like we talked about earlier, because the XP system being grindy enough to make you want to buy more packs is a manufactured issue that doesn't need to be there except to make money. So that's pretty neat. But anyway, I'm just waiting for the new update and... What's that? There's a new character out. Uh... I don't know. It costs $9.99 and I'm starting to think things are getting a bit much. But not only have I been playing almost every day for the past six months, but I think I've spent at least 79 GBP on the game already. I can't just drop everything I put into this game without seeing it through to the end, it wouldn't be right, and besides, this character is really important to the current arc of the main story, so maybe I'll find something important. And mission complete. Congratulations, you're now a whale. As planned by Rayok, by Torolf Jernström, and by any other company trying to find new ways to monetize their games in today's industry and accumulate more money. Not because more honest forms of selling were unsustainable, they were perfectly sustainable, it's just that this way makes more money from the individual consumer and fuck everyone else. This is what Citus 2 was built for. It's not its main purpose, I'm not gonna sit here and say it's all a smokescreen and that passionate people aren't working on the game, because art can stem from any crevice no matter how filthy, but as a product, this is what it does to you. From the XP, to the character expansions, to the drip feed storytelling. Citus 2 was purposely designed to turn any player that installs it into a whale. Someone who through long-term conditioning spends enough money for Rayarch to obtain the revenue of multiple customers from a single individual with minimal hesitation. Which when multiplied across multiple whales can lead to an immense amount of wealth on top of the more strong-willed consumers who just buy a few packs here and there or just bought the base game and nothing else. If the game was just excessive, that would be one thing. But it's the the fact that it knows it's excessive and wants to 
brainwash you into thinking the contrary that makes the game all the more insidious. This is something I've only just recently been able to verbalize and describe in detail, but I feel like deep down this was the true reason I ended up despising Citus 2 with a burning passion since it came out. All of this is exceptionally predatory and uses the exact same established, coined, and buzzworded techniques you can find in areas of AAA gaming, like in-game currency microtransactions and yes, even loot box gambling. In some scenarios like Citus 2, DLC and expansion packs in games can be set up in a way that is just as predatory, addictive, and mentally intrusive as straight up gambling. And because this is all a mental process involving emotional investment and sunk cost fallacies, it doesn't take into account environmental factors like a customer's economic status. As shown with other corporate trends in recent years, like the abundance of live service video games and streaming platforms for television becoming cable 2.0, companies have forgotten that time and money is finite for each consumer, and as I said before, this extends beyond just rich gamers with more money than cents because everyone can be affected by this design philosophy, even those most down on their luck. In gaming discourse today, the popular thing to talk about right now is video games that encourage gambling through randomized systems and prey on those with addictive tendencies. It's something I'm really happy is being discussed and escalated to a level that even politicians and news outlets are aware, primarily because it raises awareness about the impact and validity of non-substance based addictions, and how just because the thing you're addicted to, like food, sex, or exercise isn't a chemical drug, doesn't mean it can't be addictive and harmful to your physical and mental health in excess. Because what is addiction psychologically? A dependence. A constant need for something, no matter what it is, because it happens to make your life that little bit more enriched. Hence why gaming addiction is now a verified mental illness, because contrary to what mouth breeders who only read headlines think, that immensely high dependence on video games can have tangible negative effects on your well-being. But I feel something that has fallen under the radar somewhat, and led to a bit of a double standard, is that in video game monetization, it's not just gambling that can be addictive, but just shopping in general, just buying and spending can have its own effects. Hi again. I'm Joe's Cafe. I have anxiety and depression, and on my lowest days, I sometimes boot up Amazon and order random shit I don't need just so I have something in the future to look forward to, give myself that rush of immediate satisfaction to make my lifestyle a bit more different and interesting for a few days. And this has resulted in a shopping and spending addiction, thinking buying a new product is the solution when I'm upset, thinking I can easily win other people's affection by buying things for them, days of feeling like there's nothing to do in life anymore when I run out of money for the month because all of my favourite hobbies that make me happy involve spending and almost half a year of dealing with debt with my bank just so I could afford important things like rent and insurance because I kept enabling my addiction. It is torture and stems from years of developed trauma and self-image issues, and I am the type of person game companies love to prey on through sales promotions, FOMO, confusion, solution selling, and all the other buzzwords we've learned today. And after months of assessing, I am confident in the conclusion that this was something about me and my mental health as well as others that Rayout Games wanted to exploit through Citus 2, because they knew they could earn multiple customers worth of revenue from people like me and condition those who aren't like me to process the game in a similar way. Because Citus 2 is a goldmine of bringing that addiction out. The way all the characters are lined up on the main menu so that you're constantly tempted every time you boot the game up. The promise of a more diverse, in-depth experience if you purchase them all. Meaning that the moment the base game becomes ever so slightly stale, you can just spend money to shortcut your way through the brain chem journey and give yourself immediate satisfaction of something new. Calling the DLC store the black market and presenting it as this fun in-universe area of the game. Not to mention the human brain is just naturally satisfied by completion like a full Beanie Baby collection. And I would have had so much joy and satisfaction if I looked at the home screen with every last character unlocked and maxed out, while still having a voice deep inside of my brain telling me, you are a fucking mess. And in the time it would take to max out every character, because the XP system is there to enforce a long-term habit, Rayok would have ample time to market more DLC to me, and the cycle would loop from there with no end in sight. It's funny, because I only bought Xenon, Connor, Cherry, and the one black market pack, and now when I boot up the game I get this slight irritated mental itch of sorts. Not because I'm annoyed I spent money on them, but because a part of my brain is telling me it's a collection I started but never finished, like a bookshelf with a noticeable gap, and I would have sunk so much into the game had I not gotten out when I did. And I still have the little voice arguing with me today about whether or not I should buy Miku's chapter before she disappears in May this year, because expansion packs with permanent expiry dates violating the preservation of art is another thing we have to enjoy in this immoral cesspit. One thing I was never 
never really able to make clear because it was something I could never really understand or verbalize until now, was what I look for when defining whether or not a game has good or bad in-app purchases. And I've now realized that my personal distinction is whether or not the purchases have been designed to be consumed safely. Is it actually a separate product being sold for money, or is it just one piece of a psychological con job? Which is something that can be accomplished in numerous ways, like clearly communicating to and informing the player, showing a clear cutoff of where the spending will end after a set period of time. Hell, I'm even more favorable to the idea of subscription models like Just Dance Unlimited over Song DLC, because Unlimited's 20 GBP a year rate also acts as an upper limit so that you're not spending an excess before the next paycheck, seeing each individual song as an investment you get buyer's remorse from, or worrying if you're gonna miss out because you're not spending enough in a short length of time. It has its own issues and cans of worms, like how a subscription model means you don't own any of the content, and it goes once your subscription runs out. That's a discussion we should definitely have for the future, but for the system we function in right now, it's still less of a burden on the brain that doesn't require constant attention like Citus 2. Citus 2 is none of this. You could do all the research in the world, only get expansions on sales, or budget yourself responsibly. Methods we should definitely encourage as there is an amount of consumer responsibility involved. But not only is suggesting all that while simultaneously claiming that none of this is the fault of the game, just victim blaming at that stage, but Citus 2 should still be on blast because its design straight up doesn't want you to be responsible with your money. C2 is a heavily segmented game that expects you to spend hundreds on its additional and vaguely substantial content, conditions your brain to get you as emotionally invested as possible so you feel pressure to continue spending, uses hype culture and social media influence to push players into getting caught up ASAP lest they miss out on the hype train, and worst of all, has no predefined endpoint. C2 3.0 may be around the corner, and we can froth in the mouth about hashtag end all we like, but there's no guarantee that the spending will end. There's never been one through this game's runtime, and is content with being a tumor for as long as possible until the next predatory live service is ready to go and start this cycle all over again. Even C Season 1's ending wasn't a resting point for customers, because again, it's all about keeping up with the community and not falling behind. So of course, anyone who finished Season 1 had to immediately start Season 2 the moment it began. And we have the audacity to call that art. You're more than welcome to keep enjoying Citus 2, but do not ever tell me this is just straightforward product selling. That Rayark have their customers in their best interest, or that they're better than the AAA filth we picture as moustache twirlers in skyscrapers. Because Rayark are using the exact same marketing and design strategies that actively make games worse and more predatory. And they are just as bad as the EAs, the Ubisofts, the Activisions, the Warner Bros, and so on, for more than just they sell a bunch of expensive DLC. And every single facet of Citus 2's game design is interconnected and manufactured with capital as a top priority. Not sustainability, like fans like to say. Capital. Excess wealth. All of the money. But none of that came to mind for a lot of you until you started bickering about some gacha system or something, so I guess I need to talk about that now. Game companies in today's industry oftentimes approach monetization in an all-of-the-money mindset, in the sense that making some money is nice, subsidizing the development costs is all well and good, I suppose, but if there's an area of the game that's gone without a price tag of some kind, and monetizing that means we could be making more money, then let's do it, sign me up. This is the main reason why you see so many reactionary pundits when an unsavory business model occurs, no matter how small it may seem, because if there's one thing game companies capture on its complacency. In gaming, inaction or indifference towards something you might have an issue with results in that issue becoming the new standard, and from there, companies will try to gradually inch forward with your complacency to see just how far they can reach before you start any substantial backlash. And in Citus 2 version 2.8.5, Rayark tried seeing just how much more straw the camel's back could take with the Capso system. Capso, for the uninitiated, is a 999 GBP expansion pack with gacha mechanics that appears on the black market, although once per just has no additional transactions and doesn't give you the ability to buy pulls with real money. That is, unless you own the Chinese version of Citus 2, where on top of the Capso system itself costing up front as its regional equivalent, you also have the ability to purchase Capso coins with real money, that not only let you unlock more Capso pulls, but even increase the odds of unlocking new items by a minuscule amount. This once again has only appeared in the Chinese version, but if it ends up appearing in international copies at a later date, that will most assuredly have been a strategic move, as the unspoken implied 
promise of no real money microtransactions during the initial rollout would have made the Capso system look more appealing enough for early adopters to purchase. So while I'm telling you how this system works, I want you to have in the back of your mind that Citus 2 is a video game that has gambling mechanics in it, and that Rayart Games are a company that advocate gambling in a video game made for ages 15 and older. In summary, once you spend that 9.99, you earn letters that spell out the word Capso as you grind songs in the rhythm game, and getting all five letters earns you a pull on the Capso draw, which can earn you alternate thumbnails for the character select screen, gallery artwork, alternate novelty hit sounds for the rhythm game, XP bonuses, charts for the new fourth difficulty level, as well as full-on songs returning from the first Citus, which can only be unlocked through Capso. So it's basically bonus content, that thing video games usually bundle with, except it costs money and you have to grind for it anyway after buying it, and just like the XP system, was of course put there as a measure to keep people in habit and hobby. Citus 2 is over two years old at this point, so there are players who have purchased all available content and maxed out every character, especially as Citus 2 is now on Google Play Pass, where Android users in the US, and I'd like to emphasize only Android users in the US in case anyone tries to use Play Pass as a gotcha to this entire essay, can pay 5 US dollars a month for the entirety of Citus 2 with all of its DLC, including Capso, at no extra cost. Because speaking hypothetically as Rayark for a sec, if we end up having players who aren't actively involved in the gameplay, aren't making the game their routine and just leaving it installed in case a new patch comes, they'll be harder to market to as they'll lose some of their emotional investment over time. Play Pass players are in particular a problem if they lose investment, because Google only pays us Play Pass royalties respective to how much game time players put into the game. So we implement a secondary grinding mechanic on top of character XP, where you unlock a bunch of random tat we pulled out of our ass and make it so a gacha pull can even unlock you absolutely nothing just to keep you engaged and superfluously rewarded for as long as possible. In fact, remember that thing I said about Capso coins in the Chinese version? As per China's laws on gambling with real money, the Chinese version of Citus 2 is legally obligated to show the unlock odds, which when using Capso pulls earned in-game are a pathetic 1.84% chance per item, and pulls unlocked using Capso coins bumping it up to a just as meager 2.44% chance per item. There's no odds listed for the outcome where you earn nothing, however, and this is because the outcome where you earn nothing appears when Capso's random draw lands on an unlock you already own. So in essence, the more Capso unlocks you already have, the more likely you are to get nothing in return later on, even if you spent money on Capso coins. It feels so weird talking about a system like this in a game made by a developer who made one of the most thought-provoking rhythm games ever made, like what the fuck actually went wrong guys, did we go into a bad timeline? Basically, Capso, especially in the context of Play Pass, is like the gaming equivalent of those YouTube videos that stretch out past the 10 minute mark for more ad revenue. It's a stalling mechanism. It's there to try and preserve as many whales as possible in one model, and gather as much in royalties as possible in another, and monetizes actual knickknacks that could have been patched in the game for free, unlocked with achievement items, or even sold individually with in-game currency because anything's better than gacha. Now, contrary to what C2 fans will believe, Capso is, in all honesty, the least scummiest part of Citus 2's IAPs, at least the version without the gambling, just want to emphasize that. It's still shit, but it at the very least is transparent in what it contributes to the game and what you unlock with a clear tutorial on how it functions, as well as the fact that unlike the expansion pack characters, it actually is optional in some way because it's not a substantial part of the game's experience, it's just some fun little toys that make C2 more of an endearing game. If we had to reach an in-between with Citus 2 of a business model that makes both Rayark and its customers happy and we had to leave things as intact as possible without major reworks, I would have gone with a system where everything inside the black market is paid but everything outside is free, as in you would get character expansions and chapters for free as they get patched in, and then you would earn an additional revenue stream through song packs and directly purchasable cosmetic bundles, rather than a gacha system, because at least then it's a straightforward form of monetization that isn't actively harming the experience of the core game or requiring dishonest psychological manipulation. That's actually one of the reasons I'm not willing to excuse the game with Play Pass either. It may give you access to the entire game for a more reasonable and responsible price, but not only does that have a limited availability platform and location-wise, and happened almost two years after launch when the damage was already done, but removing the transactions doesn't remove the problems with Citus 2, the addiction and hype culture facets of the game that ensure royalties keep moving in. What makes Citus 2 a particularly reprehensible case is that its model is still predatory and awful even when looking past the monetary side of things, and no matter which version of the game you play, you're still being given an inferior product because it's designed with making money at a higher priority over being a good experience. So Capso was immensely underwhelming to the point of where this was basically the first instance in the history of the game where there was a more significant sense of backlash rather than a 50-50 split. But this is the part where I unfortunately have to do that thing where I sit on a chair backwards and have a heart-to-heart -heart with Citus fans because I'ma be real with you guys. 
you suck at making backlashes. You're just awful at standing up to yourselves because you're so passive and have the self-awareness of a kettle. The problem with the Capso controversy was the refusal to acknowledge that we as an audience, through our inaction, allowed Capso to happen by being perfectly okay with all the other bullshit Rayark had been shoving in prior to this, including the character expansions. Capso's backlash was really underwhelming, boring, painful, and unfun to watch, especially when Capso coins became public knowledge. I was expecting the internet equivalent of like, I don't know, that time a gay guy got killed in that Voltron show, riots in the streets, park benches being set alight. I was sat there for a full day with a full box of popcorn thinking, surely this will piss them off. But it just consists of people in disappointment, betrayal, and melancholy acting like abandoned spouses asking how this could have happened, and it just makes you want to stand up on your soapbox and go, okay, genuine question, have we been playing different games or have you just forgotten about the whole 17176 GBP debacle we've been debating for the past two years? And no, that character bundle doesn't count, it was a 48 our sale to capitalize on later Doctors and Whales and just proves my point anyway. Capso, again the non-gambling variant, yes it was very hard adding this new information into my second draft, is not offensive in of itself, and when described to someone with no other context doesn't sound like something worth making a fuss over. But it's the implication and broader precedent Capso conveys that makes it the most atrocious late addition to a video game next to the drills from Payday 2. Not only in typical AAA fashion did Rayok implement Capso on top of the existing model, rather than as an alternative, because using just one business model instead of all of them at once would have made less money, but when you have a cult fan base that is perfectly okay with the more unconventional methods you've used thus far, it's only normal that as a profit-driven company, you would try to see just how much you'd be able to rock the boat before it tips over. As a little case study to compare to, while not an originator, Overwatch was certainly the game that popularized the loot box in the AAA industry from 2016 onwards and resulted in it showing up in other games, and it was the lack of action by the Overwatch fan base, as well as the broader gaming community, hand-waving it as harmless and just cosmetic, that not only were loot boxes normalized and mundane, but implemented in much more predatory and game-changing ways because our silence is the okay sign for companies to pull this shit. And if anything, this is something especially easy for Rayox to pull off by comparison to Activision Blizzard because this is a mobile game. People like to claim mobile gaming has made a big improvement or that Rayox are the standouts, but the thing is that most of Citus 2's IAPs have slid on by because it's a mobile game and is expected of the platform. While if this game released as it did on consoles, it would get the aggressive lambasting it deserves no question. In summary, while it doesn't mean I'm going to give us the full responsibility because it shouldn't have to be our job to keep tabs on companies to begin with, not having bad business practices in games requires a little bit of being the consumer you want to be and speaking up the moment something seems off, which is of course tricky considering the manipulation tactics I mentioned earlier. Capso was an inevitability I could predict at least a year in advance, because the already present nickel and diming the game possessed in the years prior to its DLC was met by fans with at best mild indifference and at worst unconditional devotion and praise. And I feel Citus fans to this day have learned absolutely nothing from the implementation of Capso because they keep talking about how this was supposedly so unexpected and how everything was fine before Capso came along, not realizing that they had been enabling a shit way of selling a game from the very start. In answers a counter argument I would receive from C2 fans where they would suggest that selling in more traditional ways in excess, like selling DLC and expansion packs is good because the alternative would be either energy and currency meters that limit play, or gacha systems that enable gambling addictions. But Capso has shown that no business model cancels the other out. Just because Citus 2 sold expansion packs didn't therefore mean there would be no gacha mechanics in it. This was just a random guess advocates would make up out of their ass under the assumption that the game only has IAPs when they're needed to subsidize development costs, and not whenever Rayark feel like it because they want more of your money. Capso is not a last ditch effort to fund the game. Capso is not a measure to sustainably run the game on Google Play Pass, and Capso is especially, and I really want to emphasize this last point, not a random, unexpected act of betrayal that came out of nowhere. Capso is all according to the pattern you see happening all the time in the AAA industry. Yet another con job by Rayark to accrue more excess because some money is not all of the money, and they knew you'd buy it anyway. It's no different to the other 999 expansions the game had been shipping out prior when it comes to its true purpose, and the tactics it uses to coerce worse you into becoming a whale had already been practiced in the months prior. I just want to go to bed guys, I can't do this. Which brings me to my closing entry of this whole thing. In this talk, I've been able to, to the best of my ability at least, show that Citus 2, contrary to its advocates, is not an innocent game that just happens to cost a bit much to subsidize a large budget. In actual fact, 
Citus 2 is a predatory live service platform that purposely confuses its players into buying vaguely presented IAPs, manufactures problems to sell the solutions, incites a fear of missing out to encourage fast-paced, irresponsible spending, uses a well-known monetization loop found in other mobile games to raise as large a player base as possible, and condition them into emotionally invested addicts through psychological manipulation. And on top of that, breaks fan expectations by implementing additional facets to the business model years later like Capso. All of that alone is a pretty big pill to swallow because at first this can all seem so unassuming, especially to a fan of Rayox games like myself, and as a result discussion surrounding the game is met with an immense amount of defensiveness. It's one thing to justify why you think a game is good or bad in a standard debate, but it's another thing to start making excuses on behalf of another party, claiming it's all for the greater good or for all for the sake of art without asking some serious questions. My most curious query though is, why is there any debate surrounding Citus 2 to begin with? How can something that very clearly puts consumers at a disadvantage cause those very consumers to react with such intensity, with such enthusiasm to justify and excuse how the game is managed in favour of the company, when coming to terms with all this could potentially lead to better acknowledgement of what we want out of the games we play, as well as allowing gaming as a medium to be more accessible to more audiences by stripping away this tedious business middleman. Or in a more layman way of speaking that doesn't put me on a pedestal and make me sound like I'm on some moral high ground that doesn't exist, why are gamers just so wrong all of the time. This was something I was wondering for a while, as I felt it had to be more than just a simple disagreement, and it hit me when I started playing Demo again. Demo is one of my favourite games of all time, to the point of where I made a 40 minute long video essay about why exactly it's an amazing game. I still stand by basically everything I said in that essay, and as the game has flaws, I did what I could to be critical of the game's screw-ups, and acknowledge that despite my praises, it did less than it could have due to Rayox management. This was wildly different to the fat, lonely, closeted teenage me of many years ago, who when just starting the game saw it as the greatest thing ever made that was above criticism, and whenever challenged on that idea couldn't really find substantial ways to retort other than just regurgitating about how good the soundtrack and plot is. Demo in hindsight even uses lighter versions of some of the business tactics you can find in Citus 2. Progression is done through grinding songs to grow a tree and thus build a habit, but along with that the tree grows faster by playing newer songs, meaning the impatient can be coerced into buying song packs to progress the game faster. While the song packs used to be in a separate store menu back in the 1.0 days, since 2.0 they're now on the main menu where you access the packs you own in order to further tempt the player, and the story was split in two halves with an almost two year gap in between for the purpose of not just building up emotional investment, but to keep casual players in the loop while they continue to sell post launch content. There is a chance I might just be projecting the kind of person I used to be back when I was really into demo, but considering the conversations and debates I've been involved with regarding Citus 2, as well as reading numerous quite frankly easily debunkable counterclaims, I think there's some parallel here. Seriously, I've spent the past couple of days sifting through months worth of comments and reddit posts to find more arguments because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything with this essay, and from a pool of hundreds of people, it's literally the same one or two recycled counterarguments and bits of conjecture over and over where I just give the exact same responses over and over. And no, I didn't want to give the I've spent hundreds of dollars on my arcade so it's therefore fine argument the time of day. Just because you were raised with a shit business practice doesn't mean the business practice is therefore fine. You guys are exhausting, honestly. Gaming is a very significant artistic medium, because every game can have a tangible effect in some way of who we are and who we aspire to be. They can teach us lessons, they can influence how we act around others, they can be the coping mechanism that comforts us while the world's on fire outside. On top of that, because video games are so broad with so many different titles, genres, and thus communities, we can be quick to settle into our own niche and attach games we love to our personal identities, because as people we crave to find labels and boxes we can place ourselves in so we can feel less alone and less like outcasts. Now, I'm definitely not one to talk about giving games personal value and crediting them for the positive impacts they've had on your life. It's through games that I've been able to further understand what I love most about artistic mediums and come to terms with things like my sexuality, my mental health, and my relationships with others. But the issue stems from when that attachment between you and the game is so tight that you start seeing things in black and white, without nuance and free thinking and associating the treatment of the game by others as treatment towards yourself. Someone can play Citus 2 and become immensely invested through their love of the gameplay, the characters, the story and so on, and condition themselves into the belief that they need to love as much about the game as possible to prove their devotion and attachment, because criticising an element of it would seem like a form of personal betrayal or look like they're being a hypocrite for criticising something they love, which causes an identity crisis that needs a lot of personal introspection and deconstructing the game on a critical
local level. Then, when some 19-year-old from the UK pipes up on the internet about how the thing you love dearly might have a few problems that makes it a less than desirable product, that can seem like a personal attack on you and your lifestyle. Not only because of the criticism itself, but it gives you this rotten feeling. This assumption that by loving the thing that's being criticised, you're therefore being called a terrible person who doesn't know better by liking it. As such, you lock up, you stand your ground, you advocate for the points of contention because you need to prove you're not all those bad things, which means going for any counter-argument or gotcha you can think of to justify your stance, even if you can't prove it or deep down you don't believe it to be true. A common element of C2 discourse and just gaming discourse in general is intellectual dishonesty, a state wherein you make arguments that you either don't really care about the contents of, or don't know for certain are legitimate, but you use anyway for the purpose of winning an argument. Citus fans like to preach a lot about helping artists, supporting small developers, and the generosity of and hard work of Rayarch to justify C2's rampant IAPs, and hell, might just do the same with this very essay. Just because they say that, however, doesn't necessarily mean it's what they actually believe. There's also the chance that, regardless of their actual beliefs, they don't even care about the developers, artists and musicians anyway. It's just just to an advocate, a counterargument that sounds nice, and to them only a bully would be against such a quote-unquote charitable perspective, is because when Citus 2 is called predatory, C2 fans in their insecurity think that means they're being called awful people for being advocates of such awful things, or being called stupid or lesser for not noticing or caring, even when no such accusation is made to begin with. And rather than being honest with their perspective or take another into consideration, they try to spin the situation into something that makes their side good-hearted and charitable, ignoring their actual intent. It's part of a desperate bid to jump to any and all counterarguments that sound good regardless of their legitimacy, so they can consume what they like in blissful ignorance without needing to think about the legitimate problems, the way they can negatively affect others, or that less predatory means of selling a game exist that would still preserve what they love about the game and benefit them. When a Citus 2 fan says, this business model is needed so the hardworking developers can put food on the table, for the most part, they're lying, knowingly or unknowingly, and deep down it's actually code for, I don't want to think about things, I just want to consume, and they know the latter is less likely to make themselves look like the winner of an argument, so go for the former. And while debating in this defensive manner, they can shut down critics regardless of the legitimacy of their points as just being entitled, or wanting everything for free, or quote, the reason artists are starving in the world. Again, wrongly implying that workers' rights and customer rights are mutually exclusive and that only one of the two can be accomplished. You're more than welcome to disagree with me, but where I draw the line is when you're content with lying to my face about how you actually feel, so you can paint me as the bad guy, as the shit smearer that starts arguments, and pretend to sit on a moral high ground that can be debunked in no time at all, because it just shows not just your inability to have a cohesive opinion on the matter, but to even just tell me the truth of how you feel. Hi again. I'm Joe's Cafe. Demo is one of my favourite games of all time, and one of the most elegantly made rhythm games in the whole genre, but I hate its monetization with a burning passion. Demo 2.0 was a dumb move that should have been in the game from the start, Reborn is a flaccid remake that doesn't need to exist, and the movie is gonna be bad. Or if you want to step up to something a bit more extreme, hi, Joe's Cafe. Persona is one of my favourite franchises of all time, as it got me out of my social shell and taught me how to become aware of myself and strive to become a better person, but the entries in the series I love have areas where they fall short in writing because they were directed by a creepy man who's never made friends with a woman, and in this era of the series has very visible and very harmful issues with regards to blatant sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. Showing this love and personal attachment to games is a marvellous thing, and acknowledging these issues and wanting to do something about them doesn't somehow invalidate what made you love them or make you a hypocrite, and actively trying to raise awareness of the problems and find solutions will only lead to making more of the splendid art we enjoy so much. Rayark Games is a wonderful collection of talented creatives who have released some of the greatest rhythm games ever, exude so much ambition and creative expression, and they have my thanks for showing me the wonders of that expression so they could be inspirations for my own artistic journey, building my enthusiasm to tell the world more about my views on art and society, grant me my love of music, the power music gives others, and so much more. But in the same breath, Rayart Games is one of the worst, most predatory companies in the game industry right now, as their games are hindered by excessive and manipulative 
manipulative business practices that make them harder to enjoy and get immersed in. The message was made clear over the past few years that they prioritize get-rich-quick schemes over the happiness and well-being of their customers, even if it means targeting those with vulnerable mental states. Rayout, quite frankly, do not deserve the franchises or talented creators sitting under their roof, and have the heartiest of fuck yous from me for mistreating the art that I love. That's my perspective, and it allows me to make long-length essays about the accomplishments of their games while simultaneously making an essay like this, as well as lead me to my decision to no longer purchase or play any more of Rayark's future games unless I've done my research beforehand and know exactly how the business model works. Because I don't want to be picking up Demo 2 sometime from now, only to find out that it's sold in just as bad a fashion as Citus 2, and I'm already underwhelmed as it is seeing the game's reveal trailer because knowing Rayark's common pattern of not disclosing or revealing anything about their games for years, and just generally having an inability to not suck for five seconds, just has me watch the teaser and think, huh, I wonder how they're gonna ruin this one. You know what all of this is? It's called growing up. It's called becoming an adult, and it's something I'm still learning more and more about as time goes on. You are more than the games you love. What you get out of a game, be it joy, fear, sadness, love, enlightenment, belongs to you. You alone, and you owe nobody not even the developers for those feelings. And a part of growing up is understanding the complexities of a situation and not boiling it down to a simple accept or reject outcome. You don't need to be either a paragon or a renegade, because the comfy midpoint where you can be honest and free has been there the entire time. We can pretend everything is alright, that we're getting the game we deserve and that our tens of hundreds of dollars are going towards making art. But in the bigger picture, and in its broader implications, Citus 2's business model is not a supporter of art. Citus 2's business model is a hindrance of art. Citus 2 is predatory. Cap so bad, stop playing bad games. Thank you for listening to the very first episode of Joe's Cast, the audio essay series written and narrated by myself, Joe's Cafe. To support me and follow the rest of my work, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel and following me on my Twitter, Instagram, and Twitch, as well as my SoundCloud, to listen to the audio-only version without YouTube's compression. All links are available in the description. Thanks very much, and I'll see you when I see you.